Well, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, thank you, Shai, Haigai, colleagues. Um, as with other opportunities to be here, um, it, it's really been fantastic how the different papers have been working together. Um, okay, I have a uh, too much to sort of read through in in the details, and also um, I don't think I pulled off exactly what I was attempting. So. What I'm going to do is I'll, I'll read some parts and say what I was trying to do. And I, I think it's a project that can be pulled off. Um, but it's a, it's a fairly ambitious one. And it's um, for, uh, for those familiar with sort of um, currents in philosophical dispute, it's um, an effort to justify a kind of position that increasingly is viewed as unjustifiable. Um, so in a jargon, a defense of an externalism in ethics. Um, and here, to, to frame the context, say one of the prominent Kantians today, uh, Korsgaard, uh, Christine Korsgaard, uh, in a very influential paper uh, has an account of internalism, externalism discussion where basically she says we're all internalists. Um, it, by that meaning there's a, there's a kind of, there's a view of agency, um, a certain means and structure that is defended and regarded as central for ethical theory. Um, and I, I want to work with something like it, be in dialogue with this tradition, but defend an account that takes much of the content of the moral life and sort of places it outside. And then you have this very tricky relation between the agent and these contents. So as a as a way of getting at that, um, I, I'm going to look at aesthetic practices. Uh, so in this essay, I seek to justify a kind of moral stance rarely acknowledged as legitimate in current philosophical accounts of practical rationality and ethics, but commonly recognized by most people in contexts of moral development and religion. The moral stance I contemplate involves two important features. One, an agent is aware of a course of action that involves some kind of pain and suffering. And two, the agent chooses the action, regards it as the right course of action because of its negative hedonic valence. And it's that because of here that is going to be very tricky to unpack. I call actions having these features direct ascetic actions and call the clusters of types of such actions direct ascetic practices. Now direct ascetic practices are distinguished from indirect ascetic practices by the way the negative hedonic valence or gradient associated with action is itself a reason for selecting the action. So in contrast, for what I'm calling indirect ascetic actions. These may involve some pain and suffering, but these are accidental features of the actions that are selected for some other reason. So a simple example, a person may endure pain associated with a new exercise routine in order to attain enhanced health and well-being. So it's ascetic in the sense that it's driving against some pain, um, but it's indirectly ascetic because that driving against the negative hedonic gradient is for some other good explicitly articulated and guiding the action and making the action rational. So all normative ethical theories allow for the indirect kinds. Um, most reject direct ascetic practices. 
Now, a negative hedonic state um, may be selected because it's regarded as an intrinsic good or because it's instrumental. I call masochistic practices directed to negative hedonic states as intrinsic goods. Um, I want to distinguish direct ascetic practices from masochistic practices by the way they take the negative hedonic gradient as instrumental rather than intrinsic um, as good. Now this double contrast I'm wanting to make between direct ascetic practices and indirect practices on one hand and between direct ascetic practices and masochistic practices on the other hand, um, that's the, the tricky kind of double contrast to make. So if something is instrumental, then it seems to be instrumental for something else. So direct, distinguished from indirect ascetic practice, if this is by the negative, the way the negative hedonic valence enters in as a reason for selecting action, we ask why isn't some other intrinsic or instru uh, instrumental good presented as the reason for that instrumental action. So how can you have something instrumental without being able to articulate the alternative good, whether intrinsic or instrumental, that is that good for the sake of which something, the negative um, hedonic gradient you're pushing against is instrumental. So what makes it a tricky position to defend is the way it seems to push against the whole means end structure of agency. It seems to undermine that core logic that's seen as central to um, a, an account of rational agency. So my defense is going to proceed as follows. Um, first, in a very quick way, I'm going to try provide a rough sketch of a scenario to make plausible the line of defense for the direct ascetic practice. I'm going to do this by looking at a paternalistic intervention in relation to an immature agent. Um, I start by looking at it from the perspective of the paternalistic agent, and from that perspective, um, you can view it in a traditional way. It'll be um, the, the ascetic practice is indirect. But then I'm going to ask, shift to the perspective of the immature agent who's having this action imposed. And part of what makes the immature agent immature is the agent doesn't appreciate the good in question. And then I want to ask, what would it mean to have the right kind of transition from immaturity to maturity and I'm going to argue that this direct ascetic practice is sort of a middle step in that process of maturation. Um, so one way of looking at it, there's sort of a classic virtue acquisition problem, you know, traced back to Aristotle in terms of how you get from the immature agent to the kind of rational agent normally contemplated. I'm going to be presenting the direct ascetic action as um, sort of that middle step that helps us make sense, at least in part, of that virtue acquisition problem. Um, now, here, um, for the immature agent, the crucial move is going to be appreciating immaturity, recognizing that the hedonic gradient is pushing you in the wrong direction, then flipping, seeing that you need to push against it, but not yet seeing what is that end for the sake of which pushing against that negative hedonic gradient gets you in the right direction. So here there's, there's a sense of good to which the action is instrumental, but good is like a placeholder for something you don't yet grasp. And because it's like this blank placeholder, 
the normal kind of means and logic can't be operative with respect to it, right? You justify the means in relation to that good that the means enables you to attain. So if good is just a blank placeholder, um, then you can't see how pushing against that gradient is instrumental to it. So um, how do you move toward that? Um, for this, I, I'm going to just be very quick in sketching kind of a bunch of moves to be made um, from a certain, what might be viewed as eliminative account of agency, which starts with a third person perspective, tries to provide a scientific kind of description of motivational structures. And I think this in many ways is there's always sort of this, a certain kind of naturalist program behind the accounts of agency I'm wanting to look at, and I think an effort to defend them in such a way that we can move from our scientific third-person descriptions to somehow getting an account of agency. And then the transition step is to a non-eliminative account of agency is getting the right kind of transparency from what might be viewed as the lower order causal structures of motivation to transparency within awareness, and then a kind of agency that can have bite, as it were, with respect to the world in such a way that it's altered for the sake of the flourishing of the agency. So how do you get to this transparency of agency from the eliminative, eliminative account um, and Central to this description is how do you view hedonic states and initially the motivational structure associated with them that's very often associated with the immature agent, right? Part of what makes the immature agent the immature agent often compared to the animal is this, you know, you feel the tug of pleasure, aversion to pain, you're, you're like a little hedonic calculator and you're you're drawn toward the pleasure, away from the pain. How do you get from that kind of machinery to the self-awareness of an agent that can modulate this in a rational way? Um, so let me turn now to the very quick uh, effort at motivating. And I present two scenarios initially of a paternalistic agent um, these are actually somewhat autobiographical. Um, one is a scenario of a person tempted by drugs, a friend um, who realizes that to push hard against uh, kind of that drug use puts the friendship at risk and it needs to do it explicitly. So you have a person experimenting with recreational drugs and um, you know, a close friend uh, says, you have to stop this or I won't be your friend anymore. Um, the friend, I'm assuming, is doing this out of motives of care for the person involved in the drug use and um, is attempting to play a role in sort of kicking them out of what seems to be a downward slide and being on the edge of a tipping point. Um, as I mentioned, this is autobiographical. I had a good friend in high school that went this path. I didn't perform the role of this paternalistic agent, and he ended up ODing and um, died as a result of the habit that he was getting drawn into. So it's kind of a partly contemplating a what-if scenario, right, of a paternalistic intervention that at that stage would have put a friendship at risk um, for the sake of the other. So here I'm speaking of this person tempted as the immature agent. Um, I'm assuming that person thinks they've got it under control. They don't see the good for the sake of which they're being asked to kick out of that process. You've got a paternalistic agent who sees another kind of good, say a more complete kind of friendship, Aristotle's complete friendship, rather than the 
the more pleasure-seeking friendship, um, makes this paternalistic intervention that has, it seems, an aspect of force, right? It's kind of like trying to alter the hedonic gradient for that person to kick them out of the path they're in. But, but for it to work, right, it can't just be an altering of the hedonic calculus, right? The whole point of it is to move that person from being driven, as it were, by the pleasure gradient to attaining a kind of motivation of a different sort. And that's the, you know, how does that happen, right? It's a kind of leap from one kind of motivational structure to the next. Now I'm going to skip over the video game example. Um, and again, highlight, I, I think from the perspective of the paternalistic agent, there's a good that can be articulated for the sake of which the paternalistic intervention occurs, right? You could say um, a richer sense of life, a life not just driven by pleasure in this animal self-destructive way. Um, so here you've got a, a vision of good that's playing a role. There's a recognition, though, that the intervention, say, putting at risk the friendship, um, this is causing suffering to the other, right? The person who's involved in the recreational drug use um, has two kinds of pleasure, the pleasure of the friendship and the pleasure of the drug use. And the paternalistic agent is saying, you've got to choose one or the other. Either way, right, suffering is imposed. Loss of the pleasure associated with the drug use, loss of the pleasure associated with the friendship. Um, now, from the perspective of the paternalistic agent, right, that's, it's sort of an, do you say accidental feature, right? The imposed gradient is a response to a threat, right? To kind of kick them out of what's viewed as a greater harm to a domain um, more fitting for flourishing. But again, I'm assuming we're looking at an agent, the immature agent, who's not recognizing that alternative course. So what will it be like from the perspective of that agent? Um, there, the recognition of the good follows rather than precedes the reasoning involved. Now, how do you, how do you get there to the justification of this kind of view? Um, what I do is I, I, I first want to describe some uh, kind of a hedonic calculus, set it up in a way that's recognizable within those that are interested in ethical theory. Um, then move to, so in eliminative accounts, uh, what the agent thinks is going on, say, as a kind of inner spectator, isn't tracking what's actually going on. So I think there are some sort of classic studies uh, that, that could be examples of this. So one of the ones I really like, it's a study published a few years ago in science where you give participants um, hot or cold coffee mugs or certain pads, and then you ask them to make judgments about the interviewer at the end or make a decision on whether they give a gift to another person or to themselves. And it turns out that if you hold the warm mug or the warm pad, you regard the person as warm and friendly and nice, or you decide to give the gift to the other person rather than yourself. Well, if you hold the coffee, cold coffee mug or cold pad, then you give the gift to yourself. You're selfish, you're cold, or you regard the other person as cold and distant and harsh. Um, and the point of the study being, you know, this subtle influence, you know, you rationalize your behavior post hoc one way, but what's actually moving you to make the judgments you're making is something of a very different character. So here, 
um, kind of the spectator rationalization runs at one level, the actual mechanisms of agency run at another level, um, and they don't track one another. And then you could say the movement toward the accounts of agency, say that philosophers are generally interested in, it involves step one, a kind of chunking and transparency of the causal process in the right way within the awareness of the agent. And that gets one kind of rationality, right? What you might view as a kind of theoretical rationality internally directed. You could view it as a transparency requirement of agency. And then the second step is you have to have a kind of causal effectiveness. And when you get the two, then you get practical rationality properly constituted. And what I do is I look at sort of three representative variants of this approach. One, when you move from something like a psychological hedonism to um, a, a normative hedonism, there you're working with um, <coughs> not so much the simple pleasures, but some kind of richer hedon unit um, or some combination of them. And then you need a story for how it is that you could break the hold of the more immediate kinds of pleasures in order to get the right kind of combination of them. Um, another approach I look at is where you have a different view of the good. The good is now not in a kind of experiential qualia, um, but the good is um, some non-hedonic uh, knowledge or um, life and health or something like that. And then the third approach I look at is um, the, the kind of Kantian, um, what you will rationally is agency itself. Then these two criteria that I talked about, these themselves are what you bring about within action. You know, you have Kantian universalization on the maxim or something like that. Um, and for each of these three approaches, um, and I took them as representative, there's a, a means end structuring of agency that's central. And so then after kind of fleshing this out, um, what I try to do is make more specific why it is that the direct ascetic practices are regarded as problematic. Um, and it's basically, um, within the direct ascetic practice, you have an instrumentality, but without an end, that's explicit. Um, the negative hedonic gradient is something that's recognized as instrumental, um, but with sort of a leap outward that there's some good past what's being grasped. And what I'm arguing is that that kind of structure is central to what needs to be assumed in any of the three theories in the move from the immature agent to the mature agent. And in most of the stories, you don't get an account of that transition. And maybe for the final step, um, what if we now assume we're all always immature agents, still on the way. Um, and what if now we place much of this content in contexts of community that enable us, play a role in making us agents of the sort we are? If that's the case, then the kind of structure that I'm associating with a direct ascetic practice that becomes a constitutive feature of the moral life. Rather than a kind of extreme, rare exception, um, it, it becomes something that every one of these main theories would need to provide an account of if it ever worried more carefully about how you move from that immature agent to the rational agent rather than diving into its account of rational agency. And the paper I close with some
reflections on a passage of Aristotle that I think to point, points to this as a kind of wisdom. Um, and um, maybe I could, uh, for, for sake of time, I'll just leave that out along with um, some examples uh, in religious traditions where I think similarly there's a kind of counsel um, to drive against the hedonic gradient in the way counsel as part of a direct ascetic practice. Okay, so, thank you. Thank you. David Head. That's for you, <laughs> if you want to follow. Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, this is a, a rich paper, uh, most of which is a detailed analysis and a useful classification of various approaches to practical reason and to the particular role that pain and pleasure pl plays in them. However, my critical comments are aimed at the topic of the paper as it is represented in its title and discussed in the first and last parts, the rationality of pursuing pain. My major argument will be that although pursuing pain as an intrinsic good is indeed irrational, asceticism can be accounted for by the three models of practical reason as described by Professor Kush. The argument calls into question the distinction between direct and indirect asceticism, which serves as the axis for Kush's paper. Let me start with Kush's example of the video game child. Now, that's the exact example that he didn't uh, describe in his oral presentation. I'll just tell you that the idea is that a child is addicted to uh, video games, in, uh, uh, an adolescent probably, and uh, the parents try to uh, dissuade him uh, from uh, this uh, practice by um, really imposing on him uh, the avoidance or certain limitation on the, uh, the engagement in that practice without the child realizing the end of the, the parents have in mind. He tells them, well, uh, engaging that uh, uh, practice is good for me. I'm going to be um, a gamer and will earn a lot of money in the future. So what's the use of uh, doing homework or um, uh, making progress in, uh, in school? So this is quite similar in the conditions of the first uh, example, uh, which Kush um, uh, described in his presentation. Now, methodologically, there's a problem with the examples in which as Kosh uh, admits, the motivation is fuzzy or ambiguous. The fuzz their fuzziness undermines, I think, their usefulness in highlighting a general idea such as that of direct ascetic practices. I certainly agree that the parents in this example impose on the child a practice, the end of or value of which she doesn't understand. But such paternalistically imposed practice can be easily explained in terms of Kush's own analysis of practical reason. If the child is young and completely lacks understanding of his parents' point of view, the enforced practice is followed by the child as a matter of fear or threat. It works along the lines of a natural psychological causation, which we often call conditioning. If, on the other hand, the appeal is to the child's sense, to his gradually developing a understanding, then the child may be described as accepting the painful practice as justified in terms of authority. Unlike babies, older children may have second-order reasons to rely on their parents' judgment regarding some ends and follow it even when painful and even even when painful and even when they do not understand the particular end the parents have in mind. They just trust the parents that 
they have it uh, uh, correctly and accept it as uh, authority. This is a principle of practical reason adopted also by mature adults, only by, n not only by immature children, who often have a good reason to accept the authority, for instance, of doctors who advise them to internalize certain painful habits without having a fully transparent understanding of the first order reasons guiding that authority. But however we analyze the child's example, I find it hard to characterize it as a case of direct or even indirect asceticism. For in Kush's own definition, asceticism is a matter of choice and the video game addicted child does not choose to forego pleasure unless again we view her as acting rationally in the acceptance of the parent's authority. Second point, after reviewing the three analytic models of practical reason, the Jungian, the natural uh, law, and the Kantian, and showing why they all sorry, why they can all explain indirect but not direct asceticism, Kush, uh, Kush pros proceeds to suggest a fourth model, the Aristotelian, which may be able to accommodate direct ascetic practices. This is the idea of straightening warped lumber by bending it in the opposite direction. But again, like in the previous example of the child, I'm not sure that Aristotle's case should be understood as an illustration of direct asceticism. Indeed, pleasure is sometimes an obstacle in attaining virtue, but that does not make pain as such a reason for action. It is not no less contingent or in course term accidental than the pain without which there is no gain in healthy physical exercise. Pleasure is merely a possible sign of vice, as it is a sign of virtue in the virtuous person, according to Aristotle. The criterion, unlike the sign, of both vice and virtue is rational and objective and independent of pain and pleasure. The reason to bend the piece of lumber in the other direction is to make it straight, and the fact that it is painful is only an accidental fact. We could logically or easily imagine a miser who, once being taught the virtue of giving, manages to become generous without having to painfully overspend as a means of achieving that end. Aristotle does not advocate asceticism. Pleasure is a value, although not, although not the highest good. Aristotle is, of course, not a hedonist. There is nothing good in pain unless it is useful and necessary to achieve some worthwhile rational end. If I'm right about the way to read as Aristotle, I'm not sure that he, he can serve as an example of direct asceticism. This be, brings me to the third and final comment, which raises a more general question about the concept of asceticism itself. If all choices to endure pain as a means to achieve a certain worthwhile good are considered as indirect asceticism, then it seems that we are losing the core meaning of the concept, as well as getting far beyond the common linguistic use of the term. And if direct asceticism is defined as opting for a practice because the pain involved in it, it indeed becomes hard to justify in terms of practical reason and may turn out to be uh, to conflate with other irrational forms of masochism. However, asceticism in the traditional, most re mostly religious context may be given a rational justification. It is a way of life that guides human beings to completely overcome the subjective subjection to the motivating theme power of the hedonic gradient, to lead a life with no pleasure and no pain, to dissociate oneself from the effects of bodily sensation and reach the state of spiritual purity or even nirvana. These are forms of rational justifications for asceticism anchored in some metaphysical view of the world which is completely a transparent to the ascetic, unlike the video game child. 
But no, they, they do not involve the choice of pain for the sake of pain, but only as a means for achieving a form of life which is completely non-hedonic. The fakir certainly feels the pain of the nails when he first lies on them, but his goal is to ultimately feel nothing at all. This is equally true to Christian monks, not to speak of the uh, intention of Pirkei Avot, which um, uh, Kush, um, uh, refers to in his uh, written uh, article, which I believe cannot be read as ascetic. Pain is at most a necessary stage in the achievement of a complete state of obedi obedience to God, in which hedonic value or this value becomes irrelevant and motivationally ineffective. Asceticism in this traditional sense is not an unstable middle ground as it is characterized in the paper, but a consistent and coherent way of life of mature people. So it seems that on the one hand, indirect asceticism is not really asceticism, and on the other hand, direct asceticism is impossible if pain is taken as an intrinsic rather than instrumental value. And even masochism, which could be described as the irrational counterpart of asceticism, may ultimately be explained in rational terms as has been famously attempted by Freud in his essay, The Economic Problem of Masochism. Freud begins his article by posing the question we are now discussing. I quote, if mental processes are governed by the pleasure principle, masochism is incomprehensible. If pain and unpleasure can be not simply warnings but actually aims, the, end, the pleasure principle is paralyzed. It is as though the watchmen over our mental lives were put out of action by a drug. For Freud, the positivist scientist, a rational explanation must be provided for what he calls moral masochism. In, his essay, in, the, in the essay, he argues that this masochism is grounded in guilt the need to be punished originally by the parents, that it carries some sex sexual satisfaction. On the one hand, masochism is rational in the sense that it is destructive and expresses the death instinct. Yet on the other, and that's the concluding, concluding sentence of the essay, since it has significant, I, I am quoting, since it has significance of an erotic component, even the subject's destruction of himself cannot take place without libidinal satisfaction. So even in masochism, which unlike asceticism, the transparency condition of the awareness of the end of action is not satisfied, the pleasure principle still prevails and hence is rational. Thank you. Yes, yeah. just a, a few, maybe um, just one strand, and, and because it's a rich set of comments, very, very helpful, uh, but um, too much to kind of direct, uh, address point by point. Um, so the Aristotle passage at the end that I, um, that I didn't have time to talk about in much detail, um, what I highlighted in that is, uh, so there, there's an interesting kind of circularity. Um, there's, a, there's a kind of epistemic problem for the immature agent, because for Aristotle, um, properly grasping the good is tied to virtue. So to the degree one is not virtuous, what one takes as the good is not the true good. And for Aristotle, so here's the ascetic dimension and how it, I think, enters. Uh, and this is, you know, it's a, it's a broader project to, to work out. But so if you are that base agent committed to developing virtue, realizing 
that you tend to one of the extremes, then for Aristotle there's the problem that by virtue of the vice you have, you can't properly grasp the mean. So for Aristotle, what you do is you push toward the opposite extreme. But because Aristotle also associates state of virtue and doing the virtuous with pleasure, so what marks off the difference between the virtuous and the base is um, that the virtuous takes pleasure in doing virtue, while for the one that doesn't have virtue, doing virtue is painful. So put together the epistemic problem, you don't know the mean, the need to push to the other extreme, and this relationship between being virtuous and pleasure, that means the gradient, pushing against the hedonic gradient, is information. And it's that which I mean by um, the direct ascetic practice, right? What I, what I was wanting to distinguish, so I, both of them are instrumental, but for the direct ascetic practice, the, the negative hedonic character is not accidental, something to be ignored as you know the end and are working out the means toward it. Part of what characterizes the person who's not virtuous is they don't know exactly where to go, and the negative hedonic gradient is information for them. The way you straighten the lumber is by bending the lumber the other way, going to the extreme, and it's this way that the negative hedonic gradient enters its information that I'm regarding as constitutive of the direct ascetic practice. Um, and I do think you have that quality in the, the discussion Aristotle has you know, from that passage that I was looking at. And if that becomes the model, I think similarly what you're hoping for from the child, yes, you can, as a parent, impose a, a hedonic gradient that drives the child in the direction you want the child to be driven. But as a parent, what you're hoping is that the child isn't staying there. Right? that the child will be somehow kicked to the proper motivational state. And how does the child get there? At some stage, it seems the child moves from the immediate pleasures and says that's not what it's all about. That just to withdraw from that is itself ascetic. It's a recognition that that is problematic taken as the end of life, the immediate pleasure that's associated with that. But it's not until after the withdrawal and the distance that you then have another end that can come in view, which means the order between the end and the means is inverted from the way it's normally presented in accounts of rational agency. And that's what I was wanting to highlight in the account of direct ascetic practices. Okay. Um, are there any comments or questions? Either George or David? Shai? Want to start? So, Th thank you, George, and, and thank you, uh, David. And I, I want to try and place, uh, George, your argument in the context of the conversations we've already had uh, with regards to, to pain and see, see where this takes us. This is just preliminary thoughts. Um, so, uh, so I think there, there are two main things that jump out. One is we've mainly been talking about pain thus far as a passive experience, something that happens to you, uh, the martyr or the, the, the sick person, that, that pain somehow attacks you. And, and you're talking about a situation in which uh, someone a actively takes on pain, so the ascetic uh, 
uh, move is is to actually, in some ways, actively seek um, to take on this practice. And so, so that's that's one shift. And then another shift is that uh, Chai mentioned this, and we've had this discussion yesterday also. The idea that pain pulls you in. Um, that that pain. Uh, somehow isolates you from from your surrounding, and in your account, pain is actually the one thing that uh, brings you out of yourself. That that somehow uh, is the exter- is where you're seeking the external. Um, so these are two two observations, and um, and for the question. So the the question I have for you is: I I understand. I understand where you're trying to get at is that's where you started your presentation, not the paper, when you're saying, you know, I'm looking for a different uh, account of the subject where it's external rather than, than internal. Um, but I wonder whether, and this is a question I think you've asked in the past in this conference, uh, why pain? Why, why does pain become so central to making that kind of, uh, that kind of move? Couldn't you make it you know, more broadly or more generally with a different uh, subject matter at, at hand, because it seems to me that at bottom what you're talking about is a question of a certain kind of author- moral authority. And it doesn't seem to me to necessarily have to do with the question of, of pain. So whether it's the parents or the community or God, there's a question of uh, whether we are autonomous subjects that can figure it all out on our own in itself, or whether we need some external guidance in our moral uh, behavior. And so this, that problem I understand, but why do we need to have that conversation in the context of, of pain? Um, so uh, initially, a way you put something, I wanted to react to it and correct it. But, but pausing a second, there's something, so I, I'll, I'll try to appropriate more constructively. I, I'm, I think my, my initial reaction wasn't right. So when you were saying the person is seeking pain, I was wanting to say, no, that's what I'm calling masochistic. Right, masochistic. No, um, however, ha- however, um, because of the way in a direct ascetic practice, Right? What kind of what's in view is the painful course with this sense that there's an end beyond what you can see, then the seeking is tied to that negative gradient. And at the end, in the in the context of the religious, I I try talk about how the nature of the direct ascetic practice may itself morph in different stages. So I think we never get beyond that immature stage. So if if anything, this ideal of agency associated with Kant and these accounts, I think it's, it's a kind of limit concept. We're always toward it, never there. Um, and that means that these, these negative gradients are applied. And here's kind of how I would view the, the transformation, that at the beginning, for the immature agent, it's, it's recognizing that there's more to life that, than video games, right? So it's a very, it, it's tied to what is this hedonic impulse. However, as it's transformed, um, you could say the deeper ethical impulse, it's and here, linking up with Heim's essay, which I think was a very nice framing, to the degree pain is this rupturing of the social, right? Isolation of the individual. The aesthetic, the ascetic impulse is then toward the suffering other, right? Now that, that kind of constitution of community, <coughs> formation, of a new language, right? A kind of language specific to the suffering associated with that rupture and that isolated other. Um, Kind of it's, you know, as for 
for anyone who's worked with uh, you know, those suffering from addiction or going into prisons or whatever, the, you know, there's an unpleasantness associated, you know, an, an alienness, a difficulty associated with entering into these alternate worlds where with others a kind of community can be formed. If the impulse is to whatever good is isol you know, is itself done, then you know, you might view that that service as a kind of means to something. But it seems there's there's always a there's a there's a kind of fullness that lies on the edge of the horizon of whatever it is we're grasping. And to that extent, you know, the, w the way you put it, and then um, kind of taking the frame provided by Haim earlier, I, th that would be a way of linking up these ideas to this broader reflection on pain, suffering, uh, and its role. Can I go back for a minute to, mm -hmm. and, and, and make my point again, maybe in, uh, in some other phrase, under, uh, under fra uh, another phrasing. If asceticism is, uh, involves choice, which I perfectly agree, then although I agree with your uh, description of the Aristotle case, I think there's no connection between the, the two. I mean, I, I find it a... Uh, uh, very plausible, the Aristotelian uh, uh, description of the uh, process of moral education involves exactly that circularity to which re uh, you refer, some paternalistic imposition, and a gradually growing transparency on part of the subject, the, 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 the young uh, video game uh, 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 child. But that does not relate to, to asceticism because it does not involve any choice. I mean, either the a practice uh, is imposed or enforced without any choice of the child, ju just a threat, you know, or punishment, uh, conditioning as I called it, or once it is adopted by the child as a matter of choice, then I see no alternative uh, alternative to some form of acceptan rational acceptance on the basis of the uh, parent's authority, namely the expla uh, explanation why the child does not yet understand the end, but has very rational grounds for accepting the parent's authority that they have the, the end in mind. So, I, again, this way or the other, it does not in involve asceticism. So, um, two things that your comments really helped me appreciate I need a much richer analysis of in this paper. One is the way I was using the term accidental, because there are multiple uses and they, they need to be more carefully disaggregated. The other is this aspect of choice, which I didn't really discuss, and m maybe here, just to, to highlight a feature of the challenge you're posing and to suggest that this is actually a challenge still unaddressed even in the major theories that are the alternatives, right? That, so it, if you take probably the kind of the two most discussed accounts where choice is featured, Aristotle's and Kant's, um, for Aristotle, you've got this distinction between involuntary, voluntary, chosen. And kind of choice is that term of art for this fully rational move. Um, and you're rightly challenging me because what I'm, when I'm making that distinction between the child just following the alternate hedonic gradient of a parent might impose versus kind of a, a leap, right? That the implication is that leap is choice in that sense highlighted by Aristotle and associated with this 
full account of agency. And similarly, <coughs> with Kant, you've got this, this problem. You could say sort of central is articulating that. But with, with Kant, maybe to make my distinction, you've got, um, you've got choice in that consummate sense, which for Kant is bringing together this rational principle of action. And you could say this, call it that leap at the edge of heteronomy and autonomy, you know, Villecour as opposed to Villa. Mm -hmm. um, and what if what you do now is separate Villecour in its source, right, from Villa as um, sort of the consummation, and you now locate this leap right, as that move made by the immature agent. It's sort of, it's <coughs> choice on the way rather than consummate choice in the sense of Aristotle or Kant. And I think it's, you know, this problem of choice is a, is a standard problem, you could say, unresolved in ethical theory still. And what I'm wanting to do is, is, is kind of separate out these features and for the immature agent see something on the way. It involves a genuine kind of spontaneity, but it's not choice in that consummate sense. Now, whether that's an unstable middle position, that's an open question. Yeah. Just wanted to give a chance yes. to open that's up right. here. Is if, if, uh, other people have uh, questions. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I think that uh, something bothers, bothers me about the, the model, uh, broadly speaking, and that is that uh, <clears throat> you, you present, you seem to present pain as a kind of a price, uh, so following up on the economic model, right, as a kind of price that I have to pay to get somewhere else to be a better person, to be healthier, Etc. Um, so you you position it, <coughs> position pain and suffering in uh, as, as a instrumental, functional, right? And uh, so the sense that we give suffering or pain in, in your model, its meaning is external to it. It's not only externalism and internalism in relation to the to the subject, but uh, the meaning of pain then is always somewhere else, and. Um, I'm thinking here of uh, uh, Nietzsche's uh, criticism of religion uh, and his uh, idea, really very uh, broadly uh, speaking, his idea or his criticism uh, of the weak, right, who try to find the meaning of their life, and of course for Nietzsche life is suffering, somewhere else. And then uh, uh, the priest, this is what the priest gives them, right? So the meaning or the, um, uh, what you will get for the price that you pay now is the afterlife, right, in heaven. Uh, so uh, the priest kind of plays with, with this weakness, whereas the strong or the noble uh, would be those who find meaning or sense in the experience itself. Uh, this is really uh, very broadly speaking. So what he's suggesting there, uh, if he would read the paper, is uh, to view your model as an almost a religious one in the sense that uh, you're giving sense to pain or to suffering um, as a means to some, something else. But I think that that's, um, it's problematic or maybe at least it's limiting or it limits the discussion that uh, we can have about pain, because pain is precisely what undermines the causal structure and the means and structure, and uh, proves to us again and again that not every pain is for something else. There are pains and there are <clears throat> cases of extreme uh, prolonged suffering that are for nothing. So. Um. Yeah, you know, it's a really interesting uh, observation you're making. Um, so I don't 
I don't like the idea of just pain as a price um, and kind of that economic frame on it. So when speaking of this instrumental character, I'm, it's more an, an effort to refine a taken for granted contrast class and agency than an effort to work with a specific notion of instrumentality and making pain instrumental in that sense. Um, the religious frame, uh, that's actually one I would own up to. This is, it's set within the context of, you, you might say, a certain kind of moral realism. Um, that, that there's limits to our own meaning making. Um, that often we endure without being able to make sense, but with a kind of hope for a meaning disclosed on the other side of it to a kind of role the endurance may play. Um, for how we might think about it, so at the, on the first day at the beginning, Kierkegaard was discussed in his notion of suffering. And that's actually uh, an account I would be sympathetic to. And it's one actually, it's seen in the way I use the Aristotle example, right? For the one who's base, what's painful is the experiencing of that which for the virtuous is pleasurable. Which means um, where it plays this transformative role morally, it's a kind of for tasting of that which, with the transformation made complete, right, is something intrinsically worthwhile, right? It's, it's kind of this gap between where you are and where you're going that makes something endured and a suffering, but with, an, with a hope that there's a kind of transformation involved and associated with it. And I, I like that view much more than the, the economic one with a kind of transaction and price. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm also um, tempted to throw into the mix a little bit of Hinduism and Buddhism because um, I'm also hearing echoes of uh, any yogic practice. You know, when I teach um, Asian philosophy, I think my students often conceive of a yogi as a fully realized being, a, a saint, you know, someone who has transcended this world. But a yogic practice is specifically meant to be a practice that transforms you from one state in the direction of the realized state. So by definition, a yogi is an imperfected person, but one of but somebody who is engaging in certain kinds of ascetic practices, uh, trying to at least detach themselves from the automatic pull of pleasure and the aversiveness of pain with a kind of faith that this will lead them toward greater and greater autonomy and illumination. Um, and I would say that's similarly true of, of Buddhist practice, that you're using the Buddhist practices. You're not a Buddha yet. That's why you need to use the Eightfold Path. And so it just seems to me perhaps analogous to this notion of, you know, we're not there yet in terms of fully realized self-understanding and choice, but we have some inkling that engaging in these practices will somehow, you know, open up the horizon for further disclosure. So anyway, that's just a, you know, a connection I'm making. Yeah. Um, maybe just, uh, so I, I, I framed it in a, in a, in a way tied more to Western traditions, um, there's, an, there's a kind of teleological structuring to the account I'm trying to provide. And it is working with a certain notion of agency that I'm sympathetic with. And so I think as, as some of those details are worked out, um, 
aspects of this may be taken in a more Western direction, I think, is I'd want to work it out further. There'd be some tension with, uh, especially that teleological structuring and the way, um, so here I, I'm talking about the end sort of grasped negatively, but this is to work with other processes where more explicitly ends are brought into view and clarity is gained regarding them. Uh, and so I think those things may bring out some important differences. Okay. Yes, last question. Better be a good one. <laughs> Anybody else want to go? <laughs> Uh, straight to interdisciplinarity, I guess, uh, this one. Um, I, uh, in the sciences, I would say that uh, I never mastered physics and the humanities. I don't think I'll ever get anywhere close to mastering philosophy. It's the physics of the humanities for me. But um, t two points, uh, riffing off um, partly what Drew said there. Um, just because I'm a, a, at heart a practical guy, uh, I was wondering actually about uh, mindfulness tradition in terms of what you were saying. I mean, it is taking a literal, literal interpretation of your direct aesthetic practice definition, which I actually really appreciate. I like inventing new terms and looking at them because it's really a nice little local, like really putting a point on something, focusing on it and saying where it applies, why it doesn't. It's a great, great kind of uh, instantiation of scholarship in that way. Anyway, um, in the, in, there's two ways, at least in my understanding, pe people in pain um, can approach the, can, can adopt mindfulness. and. One is to, you know, let go. The world is too much with us, you know, let go of the pain sensation. But another is to crank it up uh, to 11, like spinal tap. And uh, eventually, in that blare of focusing on the sensation, the sensation is lost. Uh, so I'm wondering if that fits in anywhere to what you're talking about. Finally, uh, also based on the, the previous comment, I think the difference perhaps you guys are having in my uneducated philosophical way is the element of time. For me, Pain um, requires time in order to have meaning. That's just me. So intrinsic to the experience of pain, feeling pain at, at that particular moment, I'd be hard pressed to actually myself, if I were experiencing that situation, to say this is inherently meaningful because I'm experiencing it now, other than in some sort of abstract sense that I would hopefully hope it would be meaningful. But over time, for example, take a security guard. He's at a factory. He's, um, he's uh, working a line. This, sorry, take a, take a guy on a, on a factory line, he works with a part, he uses part of his body repetitively. Eventually, he uh, gets chronic pain, he can't work anymore, uh, he loses his job, loses his benefits, he's a desperate straight. Uh, but eventually, he finds a job as a security guard. And he can sit down whenever he wants, his back doesn't hurt anymore, and he meets, uh, he meets the man or girl of his dreams on that job, and uh, his life changes, and eventually the pain that he experienced at the factory, based over time, becomes the transformative experience such that his life turns around, he begins to read, you know, educates himself, and you know, that's kind of a fairy tale, but again, it's a narrative that we begin to get the meaning of pain. And so, um, for me, narrative is the big, the big kind of uh, cell uh, where, we get, where we get the meaning. But the philosophy part, I don't. That, no, that was, that was a rich philosophical contribution that you just made. Um, so first on mindfulness, um, and then you, you initially set it up as maybe picking up on Drew's comment. Um, but I, I think mindfulness, the way it's used in current discourse now, it's not just tied to, you could say, the Eastern tradition from which, you know, it was drawn initially as a, as, as a kind of insight. Um, it's used in broader ways, and the way you were using it is very much, you know, I, I, I think that would fit. It would provide a frame for working out some of the, the ideas. I want to just, rather than working out the response, just highlighting a couple things that you said that I like. The, the letting go versus cranking up. I mean, one way to put that is a kind of passivity versus activity, right? Which highlights sort of role of agent as, 
you could say, subject of events underway um, versus as active, as agent in this rich sense. And by the way, you drew on these and spoke of these as two aspects, but you sort of spoke of it as, well, these are each in play sort of alternatives. I think what it highlights is a kind of tension, a middle place between activity and passivity associated with this, this odd middle on the way position I'm looking at, which has both of those features. So I wouldn't put it as an either or, but as a, I mean, it, it, that captures the ambiguity, the, the difficulty of this kind of middle position and both requiring an activity and a passivity, a kind of active passivity, you could say. And the temporal structuring is central to it. So narrative, temporality, it's absolutely essential. When I was mentioning, you know, the teleological structuring that I'd want to work out, um, narrativity is a way of capturing the irreducibility of this teleological structuring. Um, so I'm very sympathetic to the directions you were pointing. Okay, thank you guys very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.